Thank you everyone for coming to This Week in DEI. Uh, and this week we have Lady Elizabeth Fisher, who will be presenting disability during the Middle Ages. So if you have any questions, go ahead and ask either in the Facebook chat or in the Zoom chat or raise your hand on Zoom. Uh, I will be creeping behind the scenes. So I will, I will let her know of any questions that you guys have and uh, she'll hang out afterwards probably and answer anything else that might have occurred to you during the actual thing. Uh, if you are in the Zoom and your cameras are on, you may be recorded on Facebook Live, disclaimer, et cetera. Um, but yeah, go ahead and take it away, Elizabeth, and I will be here in case anyone has any questions. All right. Well, hi, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Elizabeth Fisher. I'm from the mid-realm. Um, pretty much right smack dab in the middle of the country. Um, and I teach this class on disability. I actually teach a couple different classes on disability, um, but this one is kind of my broad overview um, and then things kind of branch off from there. So I have a PowerPoint. I'm gonna go ahead and take over the screen. I always feel like I suddenly have power when I like share my screen or something. I don't know. Oh. I can't. I, can't. I fixed it. <laughs> Let's try that again. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. All right. So one of the good things about doing this online is that I finally have a better way to show some of the really beautiful photos that I have that pertain to the class instead of like, holding up a picture in like paper in front of a crowd of people. So you guys get the benefit of seeing them up close. So again, my name is Elizabeth Fisher. Um, that's my email address there. You're welcome to contact me. If you have other questions, something pops up later and you want to learn more about any specific topic, I can try to kind of direct you to them. Um, just send me an email or send me a message on Facebook. Either one is good. So first I have my kind of short focus and disclaimer comment. Um, the class is gonna focus on how societal perspectives change and how that influences the laws and healing of people. Um, I am gonna talk about a few specific people and they may or may not have something that we would consider a disability. Um, so I want people to understand that when I'm talking in this class, um, I'm talking about anybody that has a medical difference because that's how they would have classified people like in one big lump category. So some of these people that I'm gonna discuss nowadays, we would not consider them disabled, but I think their lives are really interesting and I am really dedicated in having people be remembered, especially if they maybe weren't during the time they were alive. Uh, I'm definitely focused on Europe, mostly on Western Europe. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Eastern Europe, um, but primarily Western, we're definitely Europe-centered. Um, my other disclaimer is that some of the terminology is not what we would use today. So please understand that if you see a word pop up that you're maybe like, oh my gosh, that is, whoo, okay, we can't use that. I have only left it in here for the sake of finding information because if you search for some of these things, you have to understand the word that they are labeled under in certain time frames. So that is why I've, I have chosen to keep them in there but I want people to understand that there are words here that we don't use today because we have grown and we are better people today, right? Um, but for the sake of research, you do need to know what those words were. Otherwise you won't find the right information. So last little disclaimer, a couple of these topics are kind of, kind of down. Please hang on, please hear me out. Um, I'm going to end on as positive of a note as possible, I promise. Um, but I, I teach this topic because I feel like it's really important to understand where we've come from so that we can help make the future better. Because if we don't see 
where we've come from and where we are now, it's hard to look to the future and see where we need to make changes. So that's why I teach this, even though sometimes it's a hard topic, but hopefully you'll learn something interesting. So hang on. <laughs> okay, so as far as being labeled as disabled, again, people are kind of lumped into one group with frequently with the poor, they kind of get sloughed into this big pile. Um, you could be born disabled, deformed, or medically different and be lumped under this category. You could be injured, um, whether that's in battle, at work, or just in day-to-day, -day, you know, accidents happen. Um, or you could be purposely disabled by rights of the law. And we're going to touch on that one first because it's definitely the hardest topic to get through. So I have one slide. I promise to do it and be done with the thing, and we will move on to better topics. So this is the hard one. This is what gets labeled as judicial mutilation. Okay, so what this is, is the legal practice of mutilation or maiming. And it's very strange how this was justified in history. Um, it was seen as totally legal as long as you follow the laws of your country or your area and it was generally considered to be a lenient punishment and people thought it was lenient because well I say people the lawmakers thought it was lenient because they were giving you an opportunity to survive whatever they did to you they weren't just straight up killing you so they considered it lenient even though it left people disabled or disfigured. Um, we do see this pretty much throughout history, which is also why I've thrown it at the beginning. I've kind of fought with where to put it in this discussion because we see it all throughout history. So I decided I'm just going to throw it in at the beginning and then we're just going to kind of push it off to the side and keep going forward. Um, it is interesting though that we don't really see a lot of laws against it until really current times. Um, as far as Europe goes, um, I'm not sure about other countries, but England has the English Bill of Rights in 1689. That's the first time that we see the phrase cruel and unusual punishment. And then the United States adapts, adapts, adopts that phrase in the Eighth Amendment and in our Bill of Rights in 1791. But it is not clearly defined in the United States until 1972. And that is a Supreme Court case that argued that the death penalty in and of its own was cruel and unusual punishment. So as far as like these practices go, I mean, 1972 was really not that long ago. And it's amazing that we really don't have clear definitions until not that long ago. Um, other things that we see come up in this, most people know about, like if you stole something and they cut off your hand, those kind of things that falls under this, um, but also like torture for information um, falls under this. And another oddity um, is, um, dis disfiguring and disabling soldiers that were on the losing side of battles. Um, there is a battle in, oh golly, I thought I had written down the year. I always use this example and I can never remember the year and I thought I had written it down. My apologies. What I can tell you is that the Bulgarians lost and there were a thousand of them on the losing side and they lined every one of them up and they gouged out all of their eyes except for one in 100. Every 100th person only lost one and that was so that they had people to lead them back home on the walk. So this was absolutely considered a normal practice and again a lenient practice because you had the opportunity to survive. Now, realistically, most people didn't. Um, infection, bleeding out, um, those were very real possibilities. So, not good. Like I said, 
we should discuss it. We discussed it and we're going to go forward. Okay. So from there, I'm actually going to start well before the Middle Ages. And I'm going to explain why. I had a teacher. Um, in real life, I'm a sign language interpreter. So we're going to get a little bit of deaf history in here too, just because that's what like my professional studies have been in. But I had a teacher when I was in school who talked about pulling the thread. And it's the perfect metaphor for what this class is kind of built on. So if you think about having a knit sweater and you have like that one thread that's loose, so you just kind of pick at it and you pick at it and suddenly you've pulled a row out and then you pulled another row and you keep pulling and you pull and you pull and you pull and you pull until you don't have a sweater anymore. What do you have? You have the foundations of your garment, right? You have the, the yarn. So that's what this is. I want to go all the way back to Plato because Plato set up a lot of philosophies that are going to take us hundreds of years to get past. So he had this idea of people being born with innate intelligence. And what that means is that when you were born, you had all the intelligence you were ever going to have in life. So if you talked a lot, you were very intelligent. If you could use language, you were very, you know, you were born with that. So somebody that was born who maybe couldn't speak or couldn't hear or maybe even couldn't see, you know, was missing an arm, those kind of things, those would automatically to him show that you had less intelligence from birth. And then that said, he also said, if you can't contribute to society, you weren't worth keeping around. Because why would we waste resources and energy? So you were kind of doomed from the get-go as far as Plato was concerned. And this leads, leads to our next person, who is Aristotle. And Aristotle is one of Plato's followers. So it makes sense that his um, teachings kind of follow in that same path. Um, he was partially known for saying that if you don't speak Greek specifically, you must be a barbarian. I think is kind of funny. Um, he is the first scholar that we have on record at this time mentioning the deaf. And what he says is that if you cannot speak, you cannot be educated. And as such, you should automatically be labeled as a non-person. And non-persons do not have the right to marry or own their own property. That is how their laws work. He also declares a law that says no deformed child should live. So here we have Aristotle, 380 BC, well before the Middle Ages. But look at all of the things that he's set us up for at this point in time, right? So. All the way up until the fourth century, both Greek and Roman laws are out there that support infant side. And to understand the perspective on that, I want to remind people how hard it was to keep people alive. Like you had to have money, you had to have food, you had to have heat, you had to have clothes. So if you had a child that was born and you could tell something was physically different about it. As far as they were concerned, it wasn't worth the resources to try to keep something alive that was not probably going to stay alive. And that probably wouldn't contribute to society or to the household. And that would be considered a burden. And that's why they had these laws, unfortunately. Um, so that's why we see a lot of um, like abandonment, they would leave them out in the woods, those kind of things. We've got a bunch of myths about things like that where the baby suddenly survives and grows into some hero. And, you know, we see, we see these romanticized things about it, but in reality, it really wasn't the case so much. Um, but as Christianity spreads through Europe, this view starts to change because the Christians are preaching compassion. They're, compre they're preaching charity, right? Um, and then we see this Christian emperor, um, Valentinian, who actually declares it illegal for parents to fail to provide for their offspring. 
Um, so that being said, um, unfortunately, times are really hard and illegitimacy is definitely a thing that is happening in abundance. And so we are still seeing high levels of abandonment and what's called overlaying, which is suffocation. Um, suffocation was one of those things where it was hard to prove whether it was an accident or not. Like the child could have just died in their sleep kind of thing. So that's why it is pretty prevalent. Um, and I want to say, I've got this wild statistic here. Um, in 1894, uh, there's a London coroner report, which I know is well out of our period, but I mean, we're talking like this is still happening even that far out. Um, the London coroner reports that over a thousand infants died as a result of overlaying in the year 1990 or 1894. Um, and it isn't until 1909 that overlaying is actually made a cr criminal offense in England. So again, took us a long time to get there, right? Did somebody have a question? I, I thought I saw like a thing pop up. I think you're okay. Okay. It like flashed weird at the top. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to keep going. So we're up to 1597. I have this date listed for St. Augustine. And that is the year that he becomes the first Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, he is considered the founder of the English church and the apostle of the English. And the reason he's important is because he has what is referred to as St. Augustine's guilt trip. That's what we call it now. Um, he was a monk studying uh, early Christian theology. Uh, he deciphers a passage from the Bible that says that the sins of the father are reflected upon their children for several generations to come. And therefore says that if your child is born with some sort of disability or deformity, that means that you yourself have sinned and that this is God punishing you. And we even kind of still see this, right? Like we have baptism in some um, religious practices, right, that's supposed to, like, clean you of the sins of your parents, right? So it's still kind of, kind of still trickled down. But yeah, St. Augustine's guilt trip. Um, he did all kinds of stuff. That's the only thing that's real pertinent to our conversation. And I, I just think that is kind of fascinating. And it's going to continue for a long time. People are going to talk about this reflecting the sins of their parents thing. Okay, so we are up to 1787. Generally, we're going to talk chronologically, and I'm going to kind of jump around to different countries a little bit within those time frames. So we're talking Italy right now. This is where we see the first foundling homes opening. These are for um, orphans or abandoned children. Okay, so we do see the first ones opening. Um, they start to open across Europe. They very quickly fill the capacity. Um, it's pretty much still considered infanticide, but it's a legal form of it, right? You're like giving, giving the child to a building that someone might be able to make it stay alive. It's legal. This is where we see, um, like our safe haven laws that we have actually stem all the way back to this. Um, unfortunately, you're pretty much just putting a child in a basket and walking away. And they didn't really have the ability to care for these kids. Um, at this time, Western Europe has really no understanding of being sick. Um, the idea really is you were either sick and you were going to die. You were sick and you were going to get better. Like those were the two things they understood. 
But if you were going to be sick and then stay sick, they didn't know what to do with you. So they didn't have the knowledge. They didn't have the resources. They don't really know what they're doing. And as a result, roughly about 85% of these infants still end up dying. But it's a start in the right direction. So that's, that's where we go. Okay, so I'm gonna jump over to Eastern side of Europe, same time frame, but we're gonna talk about cultures that had um, Islamic faith instead of Christian, or well, okay, y'all know what I'm talking about. Western Europe has Christian faith. I know Islamic is under that bridge, but it's it's separated at this time. So what we have going on here is entirely different than what we see in Western Europe. So we have people I'm trying to think of the right word. It just like flew out my ear. So like I said, Western Europe, they don't really know what to do with people that are sick, right? They don't understand it. They don't understand what's happening to them or why it's happening. All that they know is that they have this very strong religious belief that if there's something wrong with you, it's because God has chosen that your parents did something wrong and it has been reflected down upon you. Whereas over here, what we have going on here is that people who were different, whether that's physically or mentally, were viewed as being closer to God because God had other plans for them. In some areas, um, people with mental disorders were actually seen as being closer to God because the body was just a vessel and their spirit was already communicating with God. So that's how it was, was seen, which I think is actually a really fascinating concept. Um, this is where we see the term feeble-minded, which again is not a term that we would use nowadays, um, but it, it pops up a lot in the Middle Ages. So if you're studying more of this, it's an important term to at least have kind of put in the back of your mind. Um, in the 8th century, we see the first leprosarium built, and this is for um, people that have leprosy. What's really interesting about this is that if you were the sole beneficiary for your house and you went into this asylum, they actually gave a stipend to your family to help keep your family going, which is not something we see anywhere else at the time. In 805, we see the first official general hospital being built in Baghdad. And between 980 and 1037, that's when this guy is alive, um, there's a book written um, called The Canon of Medicine. And it's important to note that because these Islamic areas were really focused on the medicine and the why and the how and understanding how to get people better. Why were they sick? You know, they were asking all of these questions that nowhere else was asking. They were just kind of assuming and not focused on actually getting you better. Um, by the 10th century, we have about 40 hospitals on record in um, these Islamic-based areas. And by the uh, 11th and 12th centuries, both Cairo and Baghdad have dedicated mental hospitals, like specifically for mental health, which is super cool. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about this area, <clears throat> partly because some of these buildings are still around and there's some beautiful pictures of them that I want to show you guys. Um, in the ninth century, this man here, and forgive me for these names because I am not a good um, vocal herald in foreign names. Um, this is one of the, the men that helps establish a hospital in Baghdad and their hospitals are called by Maristans. I'm not entirely certain if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that's my best guess. Um, the one that he helps establish 
has on record 25 doctors, optometrists, surgeons, and bone setters. So they actually have people specialized in learning certain things, which again, we don't see in Western Europe, which is super cool. Um, this image here is from a 13th century translation of his book, um, which was called the Compendium of Medical Treaties. So again, Western Europe is focused on saving your soul because you've sinned in the eyes of God, whereas the Islamic areas are really focused on healing and they're really inspired by their prophets. Um, these are two translations of quotes from prophets. Um, one says, God never inflicts a disease unless he also makes a cure for it. And the other is, God has sent down the disease and the cure and has appointed a cure for every disease to so treat yourselves medically. That was kind of cool. Um, the natural climate of these areas is hot and dry, which means a lot of the architecture is very open. It's very airy. And that kind of accidentally aids in the healing because these places are far more clean, they're better ventilated. So they're kind of set up for success in that way. Um, also their beliefs in um, like how you set up things also ended up aiding in cleanliness and things like that. They had some really interesting policies in all of their hospitals. Um, everybody was welcome, regardless of race or religious relief, beliefs, um, your level of illness, your type of illness, your socioeconomical status, even where you came from. Like if you were from another area and you happened to come into the area and get sick, you were welcome, um, as well as your ability to pay for services. Um, pretty much all of the documentation that I had found said that if you couldn't pay, that was fine. They would rather see you get better and go about your way. So it's kind of cool. Definitely far more charitable than the fake charity we're going to see in Western Europe. <laughs> um, they also have some really cool similarities with modern hospitals. Okay, so they had 24 hour care. Um, upon entering the facility, your clothes were taken from you and packaged up and stored, and you were given clothes, so that way they could keep your clothes clean. So your linens, your sheets, your clothing, everything was changed daily. Um, they had running water. They had plenty of sunlight. Um, they actually had inspectors that would go through every day and check for cleanliness. And when you arrived, they created a treatment plan for you so that you had a goal towards getting better and leaving, um, which is another difference we're gonna see between Western and Eastern Europe. Um, I found one note that I thought was kind of amusing. Um, it said that a patient was just determined recovered when they were able to ingest and keep down the amount of bread deemed normal for a healthy person, as well as the roasted meat from a whole bird. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Like that's how, like, you're good, you're healthy, go. <laughs> and you'd be set free. So um, definitely similarities with our modern hospitals. Um, so I can see where the foundations were for where we are now. Um, this is the layout of one of the hospitals. This one is in Syria. Um, and a lot of them were laid out very similarly. They had these fountains in the central locations and then the patient rooms would kind of branch off from them. And then they had larger fountains in the courtyards. <clears throat> Excuse me a second here. Something's, something's flashing at me. It's probably me talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I was yeah, like, did I do something? Oh no, okay. No, no, you're <laughs> fine. You had a really quick comment about um, maybe making the slideshow public later, just so people can finish up notes and refer back to it later. Yeah, I have a handout too. Awesome. Um, that if people want to email, I want to update it because I actually updated it 
um, since the last time I've taught it. So I need to update it again, uh, update it again. Um, but then I can send that out if people want to email me. Yeah. And if you can send it to me too, I'll add it to your event so that people yeah. can go ahead and access it whenever. Cool. Yeah, I can do that for sure. Excellent. Thank you. Um, okay. So this is kind of a typical standard example of a layout that we see throughout a lot of the different hospitals. Um, kind of cool. Again, very similar to like what we would have where they have separated out the different areas, which also helps with containment of disease. It helps with cleanliness. It's all good. Oh, hold on. There we are. There we are. Um, this is a picture. It's a modern picture of um, that same hospital that I just showed the layout of. This is that hospital. Um, unfortunately, I did read this morning when I was double checking my sources for these pictures um, that this hospital was damaged um, due to warfare, recent warfare. Um, it was converted into a museum at one point in time um, and that's why it's so well preserved. But um, unfortunately, it said it was damaged. I don't know how badly damaged. I want to look more into that because it's. Um, and this is uh, one of the patient rooms. So, I mean, you can kind of see, I mean, it's scarce, right? Like it's nothing fancy, but you could see how they could keep it clean. And we're talking about hot climate. So they're not going to have, you know, windows like we would have, right? They're going to have the, just these open arches that let that air come and go and it helps a lot. Um, this hospital here is located in Damascus. It was founded in the 12th century. Um, it had a hospital and a medical school and today is also been converted into a museum. It's the Museum of Medicine and Science in the Arab world. So it's still there. Same building all these years later, which is amazing. <laughs> Testament to its construction for sure, right? Um, I'm just going to touch on a couple of them because I had some really beautiful modern pictures that I wanted to give people an idea of what these places look like. Um, this, this one is by far like the most elaborate one that I've seen photos of. This is actually a complex in Cairo. It had a school, a hospital, and a mausoleum. And this is one of the courtyards. It's a picture from one of the courtyards. And I just, I'm so blown away by the details in the architecture and to think like this was, this was a hospital, you know? I just think it's so beautiful. Okay. So jumping back to the other side of the um, the area, Western Europe, we also see some advances in hospitals for Western medicine, but nothing like we see on the Eastern side. Um, 1247 is when St. Mary of Bethlehem is built. It's important because um, it's the first hospital to have support from a king like he funds the building of it and this is Edward III that we're talking about um, there's a drawing of it here um, it's important to understand a few things about this hospital though um, we have hospitals for specific conditions um, such as leprosy blindness those kind of things. And then we also have some of these like general hospitals. Um, but again, they don't understand how to treat people. They don't understand why people are sick. So they're not able to provide good care. They don't have the funding. They don't have the resources. They don't have the know-how. Um, they started taking distracted patients. There's our odd term that we probably would never use in real life nowadays in 1377. Um, so these would be patients with mental illness of some sort, uh, most likely. Um, 
treatment for them was to be shackled to a wall, um, possibly undergo things like water therapy where they would be dunked in cold water or water would be poured over them. Nothing that actually made people get any better. So I want to say hospital with a really loose, loose quotation around it. Um, Because unfortunately, they just weren't providing good care. But they were providing care as far as the law was concerned. Um, This hospital in particular is where we get the phrase bedlam from. Um, It is the nickname for this hospital. Um, it's bedlam is a term that used to be used for lunacy and it became associated with this hospital and then it became negatively associated. Um, this hospital was, I am 99.9% certain this hospital is still standing. Um, the last time I checked was a couple years ago and it was, it was still in use. They've converted it and reconverted it and reconverted it. Um, but it has remained a hospital since 1247. Um, and it is not got a good reputation. Um, again, modern times, but since we're talking about foundational stuff, um, in 1997, they celebrated their 750th anniversary and people actually protested in the streets. They did not feel that an institution with such a negative history should be celebrated in any form. And I find that really intriguing that people protested in the streets and I can only imagine, I kind of wish I could see it just cause it's fascinating. Um, so yeah, that's blows your mind, blows your mind totally. Um, So that's where we are in Western Europe with hospitals, up until this point in time anyway. Um, I'm not going to go back to Eastern Europe because they kind of just keep trucking along and making advancements, and that's its own class. So I'm going to keep kind of talking about Western Europe. Okay, so we're hitting the 13th century now with our timeline. At this point in time, we start to see laws being passed labeling people as natural fools. Here is our odd term for this century. So these are frequently people with mental illness. Um, Some of them might recover, some of them might not. Um, You know, like if you got hit on the head and you had a concussion or something, you could be labeled as this while you're recovering. Um, What's unique to this time frame, though, with these people is that the king could contract care for these individuals. They would basically have a keeper. Now, if you didn't have that, um, you would pretty much have to just hope that family would take care of you um, or somebody would take care of you. Um, But basically the king would find these people that wanted to be guardians. They would pay a fee to rent the custody of the individual to be their caretaker. And then they would look after their estate for them. Now, that sounds fine and dandy, except for the part of renting people, because that's weird. Um, But the reality is that if you were their guardian, you got a share of any profits made by the estate. So if it was farmable land, you got a large share of the profits made off of farming the land. Um, And you had full control over their money. So you could always fudge a little number here or there and nobody would ever think anything of it. Um, So we see a lot of abuse of this and they actually end up changing the laws. in 1640. So out of our time period, and again, hundreds of years after this is 
starting as a practice, right? Um, but in 1640, the same criteria for getting someone labeled as a fool exists, but what their caretaker gets changes, and suddenly there is a drop of 80% in the people that are registered. So that tells you how badly abused this um, practice was. Um, generally speaking, in the 13th century, we don't have any rules or provisions about caring for um, people that were disabled as far as like this, the country, the state is concerned. Um, most people had to rely on their family. They had to beg on the streets. They had to hope that someone, maybe a religious organization, would take them in or take care of them. Um, at this point in time, the churches are following what they call the seven comfortable works, which involves, as part of their, like, religious need, um, or, like, you know, because they are religious, they have a need to um, feed, clothe, house the poor, um, visit them if they're sick, offer drink to the thirsty, um, assist in burials, those kind of things. Um, and also like counseling and comforting the sick and dying, those all fall under the, the comfortable works. So that's kind of where we are mentality wise with the religion. All right, so we're about to hit the Renaissance then. And we've got two major views that we see pop up at this point in time. One is that it must be related to Satan. We've moved past um, sins. We've moved straight past sins, and we're just connecting your right to Satan at this point. Um, or we have a small portion that sees people as an innocent, unstained by sinful human characteristics. So we have polar opposites, and it's a little confusing to decipher which is which, depending on where you're at. Um, okay, yeah, that's that slide. So uh, in 1480, there's a book that comes out, Malice Maleficorum. Um, you could do an entire class on this book. It's all about witches and how to distinguish them and what to do with them and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the reason I'm mentioning it in here is because this is where we get that some disabled people are connected to witchcraft. And he actually talks about um, women being born with disabled children that they should they should be killed. Like the mother should be killed because she must be in cahoots with the evil fairies and with Satan and they're going to swap these babies out. And so, you know, we got to get rid of the child. We got to get rid of the mother because she's obviously in cahoots. And uh, so that kind of feeds that superstition. And if you've done any sort of research on the European witch trials, like we don't need anything to help that along for real. <laughs> like clearly these women didn't do anything wrong, right? You've just had a baby. And it came out different than what the people were thinking. And here you're being accused of witchcraft. Blows my mind. Um, and then shortly after this time frame, we see Martin Luther, which most people have heard of him. Uh, he did the whole nailing of the theses and the thing. Um, I mentioned him because there's one account of his that I think is really fascinating. Um, I wish I had the kid's name because I'd love to remember him. I like to remember people. Um, but he wrote an account of an, a 12 year old boy that he met who seemed absolutely normal on the surface. Everything was fine. He was smart. He was chatty. Life was good. He looked normal. However, he couldn't stop eating everything in sight. Now, nowadays we know that there is a condition that people have this impulse to eat everything. And we know now, back then, they didn't. So 
they explain this boy's illness as having no soul. And so might as well just throw him in the river, drown him, get it over with. There was no sense in trying to save him because he clearly didn't have a soul as far as they were concerned. Um, Martin Luther convinces them to try to pray it out of him and maybe God would give him back a soul, um, which clearly does not work. Unfortunately, the boy ends up dying within a year. Um, the documentation didn't say of what I would imagine maybe of starvation. I can't imagine they were feeding him very well if all they were doing was praying over him 24 seven. I'm not sure though. Um, Okay, so here's where we're going to talk about this a little odd. We're going to talk about being paid for your differences. Um, and I want to be clear that this is not a good thing. Um, it's disguised as a good thing, but it's not really. So this image here is from an elimination. Obviously, y'all recognize this, uh, you know, this style of thing. Um, these blocks that they're on are actually a type of crutches. Um, they would be used by somebody who didn't have use of their lower limbs. So they would walk on them um, on their front hands. I think I had a picture of one in one of the very first slides too. Um, you can see that their lower legs are bandaged up. So you can tell they probably wouldn't be walking on them. The guy that's on the crutches that's standing um, appears to have lost a foot maybe. Um, what they are doing is something that you occasionally see referred to as cripple games. Again, not terminology we would use nowadays. Um, but basically, people would say, here's a couple of coins, go fight each other for our amusement. And people would watch. And, I mean, if you didn't have any money, it might be appealing to try to get some money, right? not a good way um unfortunately very humility i can't speak tonight <laughs> um it's just it's not a good thing it's not a good thing it makes me sad and we see quite a few of these um documented and discussed and this one so much as makes it into a the margins of an illumination. And um, this is another one. Um, this one is actually a game. Um, there are a couple of different letters that reference it. This happens to be, again, in the, the margins of an illumination. Um, I've left the tag on the top of it there. Um, it's a zoomed in, obviously. Um, it's the very bottom of a page. Um, this is a game that it, there are many letters written about it that we have documentation about it, um, where they would basically give bats to blind people and they would be led into a pen and a pig was let loose. And if you knocked out the pig, you could keep it. But in the process, you know, what happens when you can't see what you're swinging at, right? But people would watch this for entertainment. Now, if you didn't have any money, you didn't have any food, this may be something that you would consider resorting to just to keep your family going. Okay, so, sorry, these are my heavy topics. Um, Another thing that could happen is that you might be bought because of one of your differences. Um, and I say bought as a loose term because frequently these people were kidnapped. They might be bought from their parents um, or they might just be straight up kidnapped um, when they were younger. Um, I think it's, it's important to understand that there, there were some differences that could technically save your life because somebody found it intriguing. Um, and you may even live a life that was 
maybe materialistically or on the surface looked really good. Um, but your life was not your own. And I think that's that's the hardest part that I have to deal with it. Um, so this is where we see things like court gestures, um, people that had dwarfism or hunchbacks, those, those kind of things. Um, these people would be kept for um, the amusement of the courts. Um, I want to talk about this man in particular. I'm going to talk about a couple people in particular. Um, Petrus um, is actually born Pedro, but Pedro is not a um, appropriate name for where he ends up, so they change his name. Um, he does not have what we would consider a disability. He has a medical difference, but not what we nowadays would consider a disability. He has tri hypertrichosis, which is um, werewolf syndrome, or what we, what we call werewolf syndrome. Um, he's born in the Canary Islands in 1537. When he's 10 years old, he is captured, kidnapped, and given to King Henry II of France as a gift for his coronation. The king finds him absolutely intriguing and decides to educate him and dress him up in the finest clothes and use him as a novelty in court. And so like I said, right, on the surface, his life looks pretty good. He's living in, in the courts. He's dressed in the finest clothes. He's decently fed. He's got a place to sleep. But he's literally owned by the king. And he's paraded around. And in 1559, the king dies. He's in a um, jousting accident. And he dies, leaving everything to Catherine de' Medici, his wife. And Catherine de' Medici is not nearly as kind to him as the, as the, the records show anyway. I mean, maybe Henry wasn't as kind and we just don't know. But the records show he wasn't horribly unkind to him. Catherine is straight up mean. And that's where we have Catherine Gonzalez, who comes into this equation. She's the daughter of a royal court servant. And Catherine de Medici decides to arrange a marriage between Petrus and this girl in the hopes of acquiring more pets. That is what her, um, her notes about the entire situation say. She hopes that they will have children that also have this condition and that she will have more pets. Um, ultimately, four of their seven children are born with this condition. And the entire family is paraded around Europe and toured around. And the royalty makes money off of them for many, many, many years. And then eventually they are individually gifted out to different upper class members of society. Um, as far as what happens after that, there really isn't a lot of documentation. Um, I have found that they were married for over 40 years. Catherine dies in 1623, Catherine Gonsalves. Um, all we know is that Petrus died prior to her because she she talks about him in a in a, like a diary note or something or a letter um the last mention of him though is in 1617 he attends his grandson's christening and someone writes about it so we know he dies somewhere between 1617 and 1623 we don't have an official death record of him because he is considered a non-human because of his condition so Again, he's one of those people that I feel a need to remember because of the experience that he went through. Um, I mean, he was, he was brilliant. He knew three languages. You know, he could converse with anybody at the courts. And this is how he was treated because he was different. Um, what is fascinating, though, about them, um, he is the first case of this that we have solid documentation on because 
of the position that he was in with the king. And we have these beautiful paintings. So this is Petrus on the side, on the left side, and that is his wife, Catherine, on the right. Um, as far as their children go, I have paintings of three of the children. Um, like I said, four of the seven have the condition. The two that don't have it, I couldn't find any documentation on. I don't know if they stayed with the family or if they were sent away. I honestly don't know. But because they didn't have this condition, they weren't written about, which again is this weird dichotomy of like some things were documented because and some things weren't documented because and, and it's very weird. Um, this is another illumination of the two of them. And then these are three of the kids. And these paintings were used while they were touring um, Europe. They were commissioned um, by a duke who um, just found them absolutely fascinating. Um, so he commissioned all of these paintings to be done of them. Um, another slightly more well-known um, couple of people that were kept because of their differences by a royal family. Um, this is Henry VIII. This is a really fairly famous picture. I thought I had the tag on it of who the artist was. My apologies that I don't. Um, there's some speculation about who is in the picture. Um, there's a lot of back and forth. Generally, the consensus is that obviously it's Henry VIII and his son in the middle. They think, well, it's one of his wives next to him. They think maybe it's so-and-so, maybe it's so-and-so. I don't know. A lot of people go back and forth on which wife. Um, but the point is the consensus is pretty good that Henry VIII, Edward, and then on the side we have Mary and Elizabeth. But then if you look out into the wings, there's two more people. And there's a lot of controversy about who these two people might be. But generally, the consensus is there. And I'm going to roll with that. And we're going to talk about those two people. So we'll start with William Sommer after I take a sip of my drink. If you look him up. You will see a lot of debates on whether or not he was just a friend of the king's or if he actually was a jester or a fool. Um, I am going to, for the sake of this class, classify him as a jester and fool because this is where my belief comes in. Um, we have a letter of receipt from 1551 to William Satan. And this letter thanks him for his service and notes the 40 shillings being paid to him after the death of Somers for his services as his keeper. And keeper is a word that was used with the jesters and fools. So paying for his services as keeper, I feel is worthy enough evidence to kind of settle some of the debates. Um, these kind of jesters and fools like he would have been, um, these people could say a lot of things around the royals that could get somebody else's head chopped off um, because people thought it was amusing because it was part of their disability to maybe shout things out or be brutally honest. Um, that's why they always had a keeper that would keep them in line and usher them out of the room if they got out of hand. But generally speaking, people thought they were hilarious because they would just blurt out whatever was on their mind. So they would often say things even straight to the king that somebody else would have been like, off of his head, go, you know? Um, the double standard is just. Um, this is the other one that there's even more controversy about Jane. Um, Jane is the one who would be on the left side. Um, 
there's a lot of controversy over her who she actually was. Um, and I'm going to tell you why I think she was a jester slash fool as well. The first piece of evidence is that her head was kept shaved. Jesters and fools in the courts had shaved heads. That was one of their, um, like part of their uniform, I guess you could call it. It was a way of identifying them. Um, why a woman in the court would have a shaved head at the time otherwise doesn't make any sense. Um, other than that, we have these these words that kind of make me believe that she was. The records say she was brought in by Anne Boleyn, inherited by Catherine Parr, and passed along to Princess Mary. So those words to me say that she was a jester slash fool and was kept by the court. So that's why I believe that she was. We may never know, right? You know, we only have so much documentation. Um, it's fascinating that she's in such an official um, painting, if that is her. Again, they didn't talk about who's actually in the, the painting. That's just what we think. Um, but Jane is mentioned in a bunch of documents by these three women. So we know she was real. We know she was in the courts. We know the tiniest bit about her, but not really enough to have a good, solid understanding of her life. Okay. Okay. So since I'm already talking about Henry VIII, I'm going to keep talking about him. I'm going to talk about Elizabeth. And then I'm going to backtrack to like this point in time and talk about what's happening in Spain. So we're still going chronologically and then we're going to kind of go back a hundred years. So bear with me on that one. All right. So we all know a little bit about Henry VIII, right? Everybody knows a little bit about Henry VIII. Um, you know, he got married. He didn't want to be married. He decided to throw a giant temper tantrum and split off of his religion so that he could divorce, right? And remarry. Um, in the process of doing that, he makes this big stand in what is the dissolution of the monasteries. Basically, it's him asserting his authority and showing, like, I do what I want because I'm king, right? And since I am pushing that religion aside, I don't need all these monasteries. Unfortunately, what that means is that he destroys a ton of them. And at this point in time, these monasteries are really well established. A lot of them have big hospitals included in the property. They have giant gardens that um, they employ people to, to maintain. So they've got employees. They're feeding the people in the area. And here comes Henry VIII throwing his temper tantrum, and he just straight up destroys them. This leaves thousands of people on the streets with nothing. Um, I found a note that said by 1547, he had confiscated what was the, what would be the equivalent of $481 million in our time. Because he walked in, he took all the money, he took all the jewels, he took all the gold, you know, everything. Destroyed the place, walked out. Um, it's interesting that there is notes of a few monks and nuns being given um, compensation to walk away quietly. I'd like to find out more about that. I'll probably never get to learn more about that because who knows more than, you know, we just have some receipts, right? Um, so who knows if we'll ever know more about that? <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I've now talked for an hour straight. Um, but very few people were actually offered any sort of compensation. Most of them were just kind of left. Figure out life. Go. Um, in 1538, there's a petition sent to the king to at least reform the hospitals and, and take care of his people. Um, um, 
the funny thing about the petition is that it comes at it from the angle of you need to take care of your people, but it also talks about there's miserable people just laying in the street and they offend everybody that walks by. So, you know, is it charitable? Is it an annoyance? Eh, it's hard to kind of tell. Um, anyway, people um, start to kind of change their perspective a little bit at this point. We're starting to be told it's your civic duty to take care of people as opposed to a religious duty. That way, no matter what your religion, you're kind of looped in under the um, the notion that you should be helping. Um, at this point, we do start to see things being rebuilt. And as they're being rebuilt, the funding is coming from the wealthy. Again, I'm going to say that loosely charitable. Um, mostly they're they're doing this to gain reputation. You know, they have the money to say, oh, I funded that building over there. You know, they're not doing this out of the kindness of their heart. They're doing it for reputation. I'm fully convinced of that. Um, so. Donations and taxes are funding all of these new public buildings, but buildings are starting to be formed. So we do see a step back towards the right direction. Um, people who are able to live at home with their families are encouraged to do so nonetheless so that they don't overburden the system. Um, and as a very cool side note, there is a document from 1570 that makes note of a 70-year-old blind baker in Norwich that is still hard at work in his home bakery with his wife, which I just think is fantastic. And, like, had this mental image of, like, this, like, 70-year-old man kneading dough. I love it. Anyway, um, back in London, um, St. Bartholomew's and St. Thomas, which were one of the earlier hospitals, two hospitals that were built, are rebuilt. And the control of those hospitals goes to the Corporation of London, as does the Bethlehem Asylum that we talked about earlier. Um, there are specific orphanages opened in London, and there is also a care clinic opened, here's the quote, for the correction of habitual idlers. So I haven't d dove deep into that interpretation yet. I have some thoughts, but I'm going to I'm going to do an entire class on hospitals someday and I think I'm going to have to suss some more of that out before I get there. I forgot to keep changing my my PowerPoint. I'm sorry. Okay. So here we have Reformation and then the establishment of the Church of England. A lot of those old values and moral expectations have disappeared. They've been pushed aside. Now we're talking about civic duty and the necessity to regulate the relief of the poor and the disabled by law. It's the first time we really see some of these laws trying to take into effect, okay? So it starts in 1552 with registers of the poor. And this is the first official records that are kept of people that are labeled poor. And again, remember that under that heading would be anybody that's disabled or medically different. Anybody that couldn't work a normal sort of living because of their differences would be slumped in under that category. In 1563, we see them separate these people out into subcategories. And the subcategories, there's three of them. We have those who would work but could not, those who could work and would not, and those that were too ill, sick, old, young, etc., to work. 
So we start to see them divided out into subcategories. And what's important about this is that these are the things that lead to changes being made because they need to understand what the need is before they can make laws to actually help those in need. Um, so that's where, we, where we're starting to see all these, these lists being made, basically. Um, 1572 is the first local poor law tax is imposed. Um, and that shifts some of the local responsibilities and sets us up to create workhouses in 1576. And then 1597, we have overseers of the poor are created. And these are people that have to collect funds, raise funds, et cetera, for people that are in these other categories. Okay. And then we have what's called the Elizabethan Poor Law. It is passed in 1601. And for those of you who know anything about Queen Elizabeth, she dies in 1603. So this is really right at the end of, of her life. Um, and I'm going to stop talking about England there just because like that's where we cut off. Um, but she does a couple of, the, this law does a couple of things and it's named after her. Um, it basically consolidates all of those little tiny laws that we just saw occurring over like the last hundred years. It pulls them all into one legislation. It establishes duties of overseers, and these overseers, they're the ones who are going to collect taxes, they're going to raise funds, and they're going to distribute them to the people that need them. Um, this is not a job that somebody wants, um, especially the collecting taxes part. Not so fun. Um, it was something that was an unpaid job, um, but you were elected for it. And if you were elected and you won, that was your job until the next guy. End of discussion. Done. So it was not a wanted job, but, um, it was definitely a job that needed to be done. Um, so their main duties were to figure out how much money was needed for their area, given the records that they had of um, people that would be in need, um, collect from property owners, and then dispense either food or money. And then they also supervised the poorhouses. Um, and also under this law, there are two types of relief established. One is called outdoor and one is called indoor. Outdoor relief means that a person could be left in their home they could just be given a supplement of money to help them along, um, but they would stay um, inside their own home. Um, it's also noted under this law that parents and children are responsibilities of each other. So like if you were a parent, you're responsible for your child, but as your child ages, they're also responsible for you as you age. So if you both lived in the house, you were responsible for each other and the care of each other. Um, and then you have indoor relief, which is people that could not live in their homes. Um, so these would be people that were ill and admitted into hospitals, um, orphans, um, people that needed to live in like the poor houses or the workhouses, those kind of things. So that's what's going on in England. And like I said, we're going to bounce back a hundred years and jump over to another country. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's happening in deaf history. And that's where I'm going to wrap it up. Cause I said, I would try to end on a high note as high as I can anyway. Um, so like I said, in England, we're establishing things. We're starting to work for the people. We're getting there. We're trying real hard. We're getting there. So 1500, in Italy. This guy is important. This is Geronimo Cardano. Um, you can look up Cardano. He's kind of an interesting guy. 
Um, he was a mathematician and a physician. Um, he invented the combination lock, a couple other cool things. Kind of an interesting guy. What's important about him as far as deaf culture and deaf history goes is that he has a deaf son. And at this point in time, somebody of his status probably would have sent that son somewhere else to live, but he does not. He instead educates his son and thus is credited, bear with me here, credited for discovering that deaf people are capable of being educated. So, in 1500, it takes us to get there before this happens. And really, it comes down to the, the status of him. The fact that he is a well-respected um, man and well-known, he's taken seriously, um, blows my mind. 1500, you know? Anyway. All right, so then let's jump over to Spain and let's talk about what's happening in Spain. So, so a couple things to understand before we talk about specific people is that Spain actually had a law set in place that required a child to be able to speak. If they could not speak, by law, you were legally disenfranchised from your family. That meant that you had no right to inheritance and no right to secession and you were automatically denied an education. Um, they believe that your faith came from hearing and communicating with God. And if you were deaf, you could not do that. So you weren't even getting the religious aspect of life. Um, and so, as such, if you were wealthy, you would send your child away to a monastery. You would have the money to basically sequester these children because their physical flaws were seen as an embarrassment on the family and you wouldn't want to keep them around for people to see. But if you had money, you could send them off somewhere, right? So they were still taken care of, but they weren't at home embarrassing you. That's how it was viewed. Then we get to here, 1570. And in 1570, this man, Juan Fernandez de Velasco y Tovar, is a marquee and patron of San Salvador, the Abbey in San Salvador. He has nine children, four of which are deaf, two girls, two boys. There is Almost no documentation on the, the women because they were deemed less important because they were female. But it is documented that all four children are sent to the Abbey. Um, deafness is very common in this area at this time, and that is because of intermarrying, is, is what we are led to believe, um, that they were genetically deaf and intermarrying and kept that gene going through the families. So here's where it gets fascinating though. The monks at this abbey, they take vows of silence to be closer to God. And I would like to note the great irony here that they took vows of silence to be closer to God, but if you could not speak, you could not communicate with God and therefore had no faith. This is the part that always gets me, and I and I and I read on the topic, and I read some more, and it's always the same thing. And I think it is the the weirdest double standard I've ever learned about in my life. But anyway, because these monks take these vows of silence, they have um, what we call a sign system. It's not a sign language. It doesn't have all of the markings of a language, like the grammar and the sentence structure and, and all of the, the things you need, right, to be a language. It's just kind of some basics that get the point across. And he notices that these four siblings, they're communicating with each other, 
And he's blown away because they're communicating with each other. But these kids grew up together, right? So they have their own kind of home sign system. And they know how to communicate with each other. So he starts working with these children. And together, they start to communicate with each other. And he teaches them how to speak. They kind of come up with their own sign system between them. And what's important about all of this is that he documents every step of it. And it's very fascinating. There are like entire books on it. It's very cool. Um, so then we have one more note in 1620 um, where we're going to talk about Juan Pablo de Bonet. Um, but before we talk about him, it's important to note that in the last 50 years, because suddenly some of these aristocratic deaf children are learning how to speak, which is what the law said they had to have to be included in inheritance, the law has now been updated in those 50 years. And it says that in order to receive an inheritance, you also must be literate. You must be able to read and write. So this is where Bonet comes in. And Bonet sees that, and he sees these deaf children. Again, just from wealthy families, like, don't get it in your head that this is all children. This is These are the ones that are wealthy, aristocratic families sending them to abbeys. Um, he creates a manual alphabet system and uses that to teach reading and writing and speech reading to these children as they're coming in. And what's very interesting is, remember at the very beginning, I talked about that whole, um, you know, pulling on the thread part, right? Okay, so this is the teacher I learned this from was the teacher that taught deaf history because we see the children in the last slide, the teachings from that monk get used by this guy. His methods are continued to be used in Spain. They spread, spread to France. They ultimately spread to America. They are the direct connection to what we have as ASL now in America if you want to pull, 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 pull all the way back to the Middle Ages. So I think that's super fascinating. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's another 100 years before we see formalized deaf education in any form. Um, that doesn't happen until 1750. Um, but these are the people that paved the way for that to happen. So if we want to go back and talk about where we started and how we got here, this is where we have to look. So. That's kind of where I wrap up. I know it's a ton of information. It's a really kind of quick, brief overview of like a lot of areas. Um, like I said, I teach some like more specific little chunks of this in much more entirety, but to get an idea of kind of like where we came from, where we landed, um, this is the overview that I've kind of developed. So. Hopefully that was interesting. Um, we definitely still have a long way to go, even nowadays. Um, but I hope you can see how long it takes to make changes, right? And it's important to keep persisting and keep working because change doesn't happen overnight. And we have to change some of these perspectives before we can make changes for the people involved. So. Thank you. Thank you. That was really, really good. Thank you. Um, so does anyone have any questions um, here in Facebook Live? I've got, still got the chat up. So if anyone has any questions, now is the time. Oh, people are taking notes. I'm opening the chat now. <laughs> so I Sorry. actually have a question for you. Yeah. Um, so we talked about a lot of different um, aspects of history that I can tell are in many ways kind of setting the tone for some of the struggles we're trying to overcome and change today. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is probably the most uh, notable thing that we can point to history and go, that's where that came from. And it's still a problem today in this new way. It, 
I mean, I go all the way back to like Plato for really, you know what I mean? People are like, this is the Middle Ages. Why are you back there? Like people, people like Plato and Aristotle, these philosophers, these ancient philosophers, they set us up for failure in the long run is how I feel. Like they had all these ideas about math and geometry and everything. But when it comes to human rights, I think that they set us up for failure in the long run. And I think that seeing how people were labeled as non-human all the way that far back, you know, just because they were born with some sort of medical difference. I mean, it's, it's hard to get past that, right? And to change an entire society. I, I don't remember exactly how many it is, but I seem to recall reading once that it takes like four generations to really change a perspective. Because because it gets so ingrained, right? And you have to change like all that history, that like two thousand years worth of history behind you, it's pressing on you, right? It's pushing you forward, but you gotta like hold it back, like give it the elbow check, you know? And that's hard. And it takes strong people to push forward and to to work towards making changes. Well, and it's, it enters that cultural memory and then you're driving out not only people's kind of, you know, what, what they think and how they feel, but like just what they consider the default because that's how they were raised. Mm-hmm. So it's, no, it's hard. Um, I'm going to read one quick comment in the chat that I want to yeah. point out um, that says, this was very interesting. I have two children with special needs. So I was curious. The part about Islam was very eye opening, um, which I totally agree with. And then we've got a few more questions, comments in the Zoom chat. Um, so the first one is, do you have sources for chronic illness as a disability in period? Not specifically. So again, like I, I said, and I might have just glossed over, I don't remember now, that idea that people were sick and going to stay sick, just they, they couldn't wrap their brains around that. It just didn't make any sense. Um, And I think that's where a lot of people got lost, lost in the mix. Um, Just not understanding, like, why won't you get better, you know? Um, And and now we know sometimes you just don't get better, right? Like things happen and that's your new normal. But I've, I've now lost what the original question was. I'm sorry. (laughs) <laughs> I had a brain fart. Sources for chronic illness. Um, so I think based on what you said, also, it's probably important to remember that chronic illness as we think of it today would have looked very different. Because if what you are saying is that people didn't really understand this, like people get sick and then they just stay sick. Um yeah, it probably just wasn't a thing that got discussed very much because either the care wasn't there for people who had debilitating enough illnesses that they would lead to death, or a lot of the mental stuff would either be, if it wasn't serious enough, it would be rushed off as just, eh, they're a little weird, or mm-hmm. it would be more extreme and they would just be completely discounted. So I think that's really interesting to think about um, and how much we may have miscategorized things in period. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can tell you as far as like mental illness goes, and I don't know if we want to, it's hard, it's hard to be like modern PC with terminology when I'm discussing some of these things, because like it blows your mind. Some of the, like the way that things were written about, you're just like, what, what did I just read? Um, I know as far as like mental illness, like you, you know, you talk about like asylums in America in like the early 1900s and they're they're scary places right like go back 400 years and it's downright terrifying and so I know I've seen a lot of references of like again that feeble-minded term or absent-minded is probably where we went from there I think where they just locked them up and forgot about them because that that was what they did at the time. Not that, that that's any excuse or anything. It's just, unfortunately, I think if your family wasn't willing to take care of you, 
you were sent somewhere and just forgotten about. And that's part of part of why I wanted to teach this class is to try to remember some of these people that, you know, I feel like they deserve to be remembered because I think they've kind of been lost to history. Um, so there's probably more documentation about that, like, mental disability than there is a physical. Um, but for the most part, I think I think if your family didn't take care of you, you were just sent away. So you were out of sight. So we've got a few more questions. I do want to let people know, um, I'll read off the questions in chat. But if you do want to speak, feel free to just drop it in chat. You can ask the question yourself. Um, you can raise your hand in Zoom, uh, and I'll call on people. So you don't you don't have to type it out if you'd rather just ask. Um, but I'll just go down the chat list, and I'll keep reading. So the next thing is, uh, I'm intrigued to see how far back the definition goes of disabled equals can't work slash function slash contribute versus can work slash equaling you're fine, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you if you search, just straight up search the word like disabled history, disabled isn't isn't the, the key word that's always going to get you the the research, um, because I, I, we really don't see that label pop up as often. Like I said, they get lumped under this overall category of poor or or unable to work frequently. Um, and that sucks, right? Like, like everybody has these unique things about them and they just kind of get lumped into one big old pile and then kind of swept into that corner that nobody wants to go in. Yeah, and I think, um, I think it's interesting also how today we kind of have associated that, like the idea of like, can you work or not, right? Can you do what we consider productive uh, mm -hmm. value to society or not? Um, because we, we all know there are many people who can be productive members of society, but are still living with disability and still, I mean, there's, there's invisible disabilities. There's people whose disability will manifest under certain conditions. Um, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting way that we can ignore or overlook or miscategorize. Uh, yeah, it just, it's its a really interesting thing. I would be curious as well to see kind of how, how far back, when did we start conceptualizing that? Um, okay, we have another. Uh, do we have indications oh. beyond crutches, like for a litter or wheelchair? Um, in, what do you mean by, I saw her raise her hand. Can you tell me what you mean by indications? Well, I, I guess I was thinking about in our uh, localized period of study from uh, the SCA, I, uh, in that earlier time, obviously, you know, wheelchairs have been around for a bit Victorian and stuff, but I don't know anything before that. Um, to be honest, I, I don't have any examples of a wheelchair in any illumination that I've found so far, not to say it's not out there. Um, and not to say that they didn't exist because I have to think that somebody figured that out at some point in time, right? Um, what I have a lot of examples of are crutches, tons of forms of crutches, the, the little hand ones that, um, you saw in the one illumination, mm -hmm. um, the underarm ones, very similar to what we have. Um, I have seen some that have, um, do you know what an eye walk is? I don't know if anybody here knows what an eye walk is, where you like, terrifies me my balance is not that good it's basically like a peg leg sort of situation where you like strap it around your knee and your lower leg um it kind of looks like like that and then like so your leg would come down and then it would bend onto that that board mm -hmm. um I've seen examples of things like that um I have a couple of people being carried in like wheelbarrow kind of carts Mm -hmm. where you can see like they have a leg that's bandaged. Okay. Um, I kind of want to do a whole class on illuminations depicting disability because there's some beautiful artwork out there. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never seen a wheelchair. And okay. I have to wonder like, when did that happen? I, somebody else is raising their hand. Um, I, ha I, well, I haven't seen wheelchairs. 
I have seen some uh, Italian illuminations with uh, pictures of uh, baby walkers. Okay, yeah, so yeah. They had like like the the round thing with the wheels on it, and so I'm thinking if like they had frame. baby walkers, they might have have something like that for yeah uh, someone who might need a wheelchair. No, but yeah. I haven't seen like you. I have not seen. seen yeah, it. and you know the other thing that's really interesting is. Um, the difference in the dichotomy between like rich and poor, right? So um, I know I've, I've talked to Zara a little bit about this because like my next deep dive class that I'm working is on um, um, like injuries in battle and advancements in like medicine and prosthetics and things like that. Like that's my next class that I'm like really building. And to see... Um, to see how we start to understand different parts of how, like how our body even moves, right? Like those body mechanics and the, the mere thought that we didn't even have an understanding of that until like the 1500s just blows my mind. Like nobody was like, Hey, I wonder why that leg does that when I do this, you know what I mean? And it, it's just like, how did you not ask these questions earlier in time? You know? Um, so yeah, I'll have to look into that some more, but I, I haven't seen wheelchairs, um, just a lot of different types of crutches. Um, and, and then what was available if you were rich versus what was, was available if you were poor, totally different. I mean, you might have like a stick that you found out in your backyard that you are using as a crutch or you strapped to your leg, you know, versus actually having proper crutches that were built just for you, you know, those kind of things. Yeah, I was definitely thinking when I think of a litter, I'm like, so you would need dedicated people to help you get around with that. Um, so I can imagine that there is a huge wealth gap between who had that kind of access and um, manpower available mm -hmm. to them versus like the people who just couldn't afford any of that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, next there's... Piece, uh... Oh, go ahead. Oh, there's some... Um like major monetary differences too between um, like how disability was seen. Like we know King Richard was disabled from his scoliosis, right? But he hid it to a lot of people from all the records that we have because he didn't want to be seen as weak, right? Um, and you have like what I'm finding in my, my battle injury research that I'm doing right now is if you were poor and you got injured, it was like, oh, well, <laughs> too bad, <laughs> figure out life. But if you were rich, it was like, oh, a war hero wounded for his country, you know? It's like, oh, you both lost a hand, man. Come on, you know what I mean? Yeah. Suzanne, go ahead. I did find a website for ability tools that talked about the history of the wheelchair. Um, so the first known wheelchair purposely designed was for King Philip II of Spain in 1595. There you go. It was a right chair with small small wheels. Yeah, I put the I put the quote in the in the uh, chat if anybody's interested. So that's cool. That's what I found. Yeah, it blows my mind. I found um, the first depiction of crutches we have is actually in ancient Egypt. Like, can you imagine crutches on sand? Like, I don't even, like, that's what I'm envisioning. I know it's not all sand, but, um, but yeah, like crutches go way back. But yeah, it's interesting that nobody figured out a wheelchair until almost the 1600s. I'm not surprised it's for a king as well. Right. Um, yeah, no, that's an interesting quote, noting that like uh, wheeled transportation devices were found earlier. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess once you hit a certain point, you would need a level of wealth to get the custom design done. Um, mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to read. I have a comment. Othering people makes it easier to treat them badly. Absolutely. Um, we see that again and again across many marginalized groups, unfortunately. Um, and then another question. Uh, the example of the Bulgarian soldiers having their eyes gouged out. Was that considered a normal practice after war to disfigure slash judiciously mutilate enemy soldiers? Um, I guess it depends on the ruler. It, it was not considered unjust 
I know that doesn't quite answer your question. Um, I don't I don't think that it was like every battle they did that. Um, but it happened enough that people were like, meh, that yep, that that's war, you know, like they were very blase about it. It just was how it was. Um, I don't think it happened at everyone. I have I have one entire book that is nothing but examples of judicial mutilation, which is why I throw it in at the very beginning of this class because it's that's a hard topic. And I could talk for an hour about eye gouging and nose chopping, but I'm not sure how many of y'all will listen to me for an hour. You know what I mean? Um, but it was it was used as a way to like once you visibly disform somebody, not only have you asser- asserted your power on them, but you have now branded them for life, right? Everybody that sees that type of disfigurement is going to know somebody did that to you. They got it on you. And that's that's a power that's going to be over you for the rest of your life. Right? And that's the part that's like even more terrifying. Like if you survive the whole thing, which I mean, bleeding out and infection alone, right? If you survive. There was one place um let me see if I have it written down. Because there's one place where, like, you weren't allowed, like, if you stole something and they took your hand, you weren't allowed medical care for, like, three days. I don't have it written down. I remember reading about it, though. So if you survived the three days, then it was like, okay, God says you can live. Now you are allowed to go seek medical treatment. I know in the archery community, there's a lot of, um, and I don't know how accurate this is but there there's this lore of like in period if they caught enemy archers they would chop off um Mm -hmm. the two fingers Mm -hmm. of your dominant hand or something and so there's a symbol that i can't remember for the life of me i think it might just be like the two fingers or whatever that basically like just this that basically is like like aha i still got them um, and I don't know how accurate that is. That's something that like people have joked about within the archery community, but it makes sense, right? If you capture an enemy combatant and you're trying to be what you consider um, merciful, uh, making sure they can't go back and be a combatant against you again in the same way. It, I mean, that makes a sort of terrifying sense. Um, even though it's, you know, it's awful and I'm not in any way being like, yeah, bodily mutilation, totally, totally tracks. Like that's not, (laughs) it's hard to like, it's hard to teach this topic. Sometimes I'm like, is anyone going to listen to me for an hour while I talk about this? You know what I mean? But again, I think it's important that we, I think it's important that we know, like, this is where we came from. Like people at one point in time were taught that this is totally normal. and we, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Any thoughts of how to portray one's own disability as part of our personas? I accidentally worked my autism into a previous persona as someone who stayed in his room slash wasn't seen until young adulthood, but I wonder about doing it more conscientiously. Hmm. I guess maybe a lot depends on what you got going on your like what personally you have going on and what you're comfortable with right because I think a lot of a lot of people still aren't comfortable just being like here I am and this is all I've got going on you know what I mean um I I mean personally I think I think the more we talk about it and the more that we see things the less taboo it becomes it just becomes part of the normal which is how like I think it should be because that's just people are people right um and so I think when we hide away some of these topics that builds the the taboo up so I don't know of any like specific examples obviously if you had like a missing limb or something maybe you could like you know bandage it like they would in period or um or you know use period crutch or something personally I know like they're not really like ergonomic and your body would probably be hurting afterwards (laughs) So I wouldn't necessarily want to recommend it, but I, I think if if you were comfortable with something and 
and willing to talk about it because people are going to ask, right? Like the second you put it out there and it's visible, people are definitely going to ask and you're going to get bombarded with questions. But I think if you're okay with that, I think it's a great opportunity to to talk and educate people. So hopefully that answered the question. I don't have any specific examples though, really. Um, I've got a comment from Atash. Uh, it keeps the soldiers from fighting you again. Yep, basically. Um, and then a, co a question from Constance. Have you looked into the changeling stories as a descriptor for autism? I think that might be also in reference to the question of like incorporating uh, into your persona. But I think that could be a really interesting kind of uh, parallel to explore. I don't know a lot about that. I'd have to look more into it myself. Um, yeah. But I think that's terrifically interesting. That Yeah, that does sound interesting. I don't have any specific um, info on that. Uh, I haven't dove real deep into that. I would like to do some more research on specifically on how people's disabilities were used against them during like the, the witch hunts and that. Um, because I've seen just a few references pop up that I think there's got to be more out there. Um, but I haven't specifically looked into them as connected to, to autism, though. But they might be out there. That could be really fascinating for sure. I think it might also be interesting um, to explore how language around things has changed and how now we can kind of look back through our modern lens and say, okay, if people were described in this way, they were probably describing this particular thing. Um, and they, we just, we just wouldn't, we wouldn't have been able to talk about it in that way in period because the language didn't exist. The context didn't exist. And some things were categorized as disabilities and pathologized, even if they weren't. So mm -hmm. I think that would be, it would be interesting to kind of uh, go back and look at things through that lens. Um, and, and I don't know, maybe, maybe reveal more representation than we thought. That yeah. I mean, just like um, Petrus, I, I was torn about putting him in, right? Because it's not what we consider a disability. But back then it was, right? So I put it in there because I think he's absolutely fascinating and deserves to be remembered. Um, but through a modern lens, we wouldn't classify him as that. I so, think that's yeah. a fantastic example, though, um, because that does that does inform how we classify things now. I love that you put that in. Um, all right. So we have thank yous from people. Uh, King Tut was handicapped. They found many canes in his tomb. Cool. So, again, we kind of have a person who had the wealth in order mm -hmm. to you know, continue to live their lives despite any kind of physical disability. Um, it's interesting though, that we, we don't see that aspect highlighted very much. Like certainly that must have been something that was integral to daily life, but I didn't know that. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting that we don't, we don't see that, um, contextualized within biographies or greater stories. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have another comment. There are always new articles back speculating on diagnoses based on symptoms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, Master Raven, before your like screenshot went up, I thought I saw your hand up and I don't know if you still had a question or not. I don't want to blow you off. I saw like a hand up and then, I think we were on a topic. Yeah, I was just going to say the thing about King Tut, but um, I also did think, like we were talking, like you were mentioning before, how ironic it was that philosophers probably dismissed or or did certain things for people with handicaps or disabilities because they didn't understand them. So they just, and I just find that kind of ironic. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and like, for real, the Western, like, Western Europe, most of Europe doesn't start studying anatomy until the 1500s. So just the lack of basic knowledge about our own bodies and how they work and how they function and, you know, they just, they just assumed, like, you're 
you had this soul and it just made things happen. I guess, you know what I mean? Well, so it's from, from the, from the uh, Galen on how he came up with all of the scientific things that he did, but yeah, they accepted his stuff for over 2000 years. Mm -hmm. I didn't start questioning it for a long time. So I think they, someone even said that they was even into the 20th century. People were still trying to use some of the, the same things that he came up with. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's all kind of crazy. Yeah. We see this major taboo over um, things like gra grave robbing. Um, but if you go to the flip side of that, like the people that were doing grave robbing were all often like these doctors and these scientists and they were trying to understand how the body worked. But like we had this, this, this thing that you like, you couldn't do that. Don't do the thing. But these other people were like, I want to do the thing because I want to learn, you know, and there was this, this struggle back and forth. And, and, you know, like the idea of like stealing a body in the middle of the night and cutting it apart and like learning, oh, this leads to that. And that leads to that. And, you know, that, that that being taboo to get us to understand how we actually work you know it's just just slides right on in with the rest of it you know all right are there any other questions comments concerns discussions um i'm keeping an eye on the facebook chat anyone here okay ashley go ahead yeah, I just kind of wanted to make the comment. Um, um, I found it interesting that you're noting that people would say about chronic illness and stuff like that. They, they just didn't know what to do with it back then. And I find it ironic because we still don't know what to do with it. And I, I myself have a genetic condition and several other things that go along with it. And none of them are curable. They're not going away. They're probably just going to get worse over time, but they might wax and wane. But to, I mean, now people, even medical practitioners, they don't always know how to handle someone who doesn't get better. It's, it's an interesting phenomenon. I think, I don't know if we lost Elisabetta. We might've lost Elisabetta. Um, well, while we wait for her to be able to get back in, um, you're totally right. Uh, that is absolutely a, a thing that I've observed, not only in the medical community, but also socially. Um, we talk about microaggressions as part of the base kind of DEI 101. And often people will say things that are unintentionally hurtful because they don't understand the idea of chronic illness. They don't understand the idea of uh, people's lives being based around what they have the energy for, what they have the ability to do that particular day. And so we'll hear kind of hurtful comments about, um, I had a friend that had lost a bunch of weight very suddenly as a result of her chronic illness flaring up. And someone was like, man, well, I wish I had that. No, no, that's a terrible thing. You don't. Um, or people making, you know, heartless comments about, you um, you know, people, well, you know, if you have the energy to do this, if you've got four workable hours of energy, that's plenty of time to get to a job, get a desk job and you'll be fine. And it's like, but you have to, you have to shower and you have to get ready and then you have to get there and then you have to get home and you still need to live a life where you <laughs> feed yourself and maybe take care of other people. I mean, it's just, people can't visualize this well. We have not constructed a dialogue or education about this traditionally in our society. And so people are desperately trying to educate people now. And unfortunately, usually it's the people who are in the hardest position to do it that have to put the labor out to do it. And it's, it's just hard. It's just very, very difficult, but you're right. I mean, we're not Elizabeth, you're back. Okay. I know. I don't know what happened. I just like, it just closed down on me. Sorry. <laughs> You're fine. Um, it, it, that's a great comment. It really is. Um, and then we've got a comment on Facebook. Uh, it's interesting to see how recently some of these are too. My daughter has Down syndrome and you realize that just 50 or 70 years ago, they were put into institutions instead of raised with their families. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even, um, I mean, Down syndrome specifically, right? Like they're 
gosh, I can't, I can't remember what country it is. There's a country in Europe, I think it is, that has almost completely pulled like Down syndrome out of their um, populace because they're um, prenatal testing. And then, you know, parents choosing whether they continue with the birth or not. Like, I, so there's even another, like, perspective, right? Like, I, I worry about that sometimes when you think about the future. And as our, our prenatal technologies get more advanced, um, I worry that if people don't start seeing people as people, that, you know, they're going to, I hate to use the phrase weed out, but that, I mean, I think that's the appropriate word is, is, is pull out some really phenomenal people just because they're scared of what, um, what they've got going on, you know? See, see, people are like, look, people are starting to look up dates and they're like, Oh, Oh, like that was like, not that long ago. <laughs> It's terrifying out there how long some of these things have continued on. Yeah. The comment in chat is, in Ontario, the last, quote, institutions closed in 2009. Yikes. Yeah. No, it is it is really scary. Um, and it's really sad. And I think that's why, um, I know we're, we're getting to the end of the time. I so appreciate you teaching this class and you generally teaching about um, accessibility and disability in the period um, because this is knowledge that is desperately needed. It's it's not easy to find and aggregate into um, one talk or discussion. It's usually maybe sprinkled or you have to look up each certain thing. And it's so important for us to let this inform our current knowledge because this DEI, I mean, I'm biased, DEI is part of everything we do, right? It shouldn't be its own separate thing. It should be integrated into everything we do. We should be looking for where we can be more equitable and more inclusive everywhere. So mm -hmm. this is so big for making sure that it informs our decisions across everything. Um, any final questions from anyone? Um, Elizabeth, do you want to do you want to wrap up or say anything to close? I would just say thank you for for coming and for listening to it. I know it's not always an easy topic to listen to. Um, I I honestly used to preface this class with "This is an hour of how people were crappy to each other," but please stick around and listen. <laughs> You know, um, because I do think it's really important that, you know, we understand where we've come from so that we can make it better. Right. So thank you for being a part of that conversation and being willing to listen and and learn, you know. And thank you for teaching and thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, as soon as Elizabeth is done with the handout and the slides, I'll get those up in the event itself. Uh, so that people can just go back to the event and you should see it posted. Um, and I'll make sure that her email is also there in case you have more questions. Uh, you can also email me, equity at sca.org, uh, and I can put you in touch with her. So many, many an opportunity. Um, we do this every week. We have a class or a discussion or a panel or an interview or whatever I've put together for that week. So every Wednesday night this week in DEI, um, feel free to join us whenever. Uh, and thank you again to everyone for coming. Uh, have a great night.